So Robert Schnemberg is my name. I'm you know, for around about 16 years in CE, especially in Poland and you know, a few years also Russia. Um, I'm a typical you know, uh, German real estate banker, uh, real estate lender, uh, working these days for Berlin Hip since three years with Berlin Hip. Berlin Hip is a bank which concentrates you know, predominantly on commercial real estate lending. Uh, so we lend to Poland and Czech Republic and Czech Republic predominantly to Prague. Great, Luke, and you've got quite an interesting background uh, in terms of coming from Canada to start with, so let's... Um, so my name is Luke Dawson. I've um, been with Collier since 2004, started in the Canadian office, and in 2007 uh, took over uh, managing Central Europe, um, covering off at the time, head of operations for Russia all the way down south through to Greece. Um, had a few stops in between, was located in Southeast Europe for a few years, running our operations there. Um, and then up until February of this year, I was based in Dubai, um, working in the Middle East. And I've come back to Collier's, so right now I'm in charge of capital markets and I'm also running the region for Central Europe. So for us as Collier's, um, Central Europe, we define as, because I know everyone has their own definitions, um, it's Czech Republic, Poland, um, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. Um, so I'm overseeing the capital markets for all of those countries and then managing the offices, everything excluding Poland. Um, Collier's has been in Central Europe for over 25 years now, so we've got a long track record in the region uh, and we've, we've seen this cycle uh, a few times that Mark was going through before. So it's an interesting one. This time we actually feel it's different and it's something we'll, we'll touch on as we go through the panel. Uh, but yeah, it, it's been, for me, over 10 years in Central Europe. So it's, uh, it's an interesting one to go through your, your second cycle now. Great, Tim. Morning. Um, I work for uh, Chaitin Capital. Chaitin is a private equity real estate fund that focuses on Southeastern Europe. So that's Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, Croatia. Um, we are 10 years old. We manage three funds and manage several hundred million euros to date. Before that, I was nine years at Europa Capital, where I helped raise and then managed its Emerging Europe Fund. And then, but prior to that, I was 14 years at EBRD. So I've spent 25 years um, in real estate in Central and Eastern Europe and covered really most of the region from Central uh, Europe to Central Asia. Great. Um, Luke, let's maybe just start with you. Um, I mean, so we've seen here from, from Mark about the macro picture um, in terms of the economics and what's happening there. Um, and in comparison to other parts of Europe, it seems to be more of an engine of growth, really, if, if, you, if you pick up on what's been happening. Um, how do you see that influencing the region as a whole in terms of the real estate side? Um, and do you think there are kind of winners and losers from that? What's your sense, or is everybody a winner? How, how do you see it? Um, I would say that when you look at us as an engine of growth, uh, we're actually a byproduct of the engine largely of Germany and the rest of Europe. And we, we benefit from the growth that's happening across Europe right now. In terms of, of winners and losers, um, Luckily, I would say that all of the sectors within Central Europe have been performing fairly well over the last, well actually very well over the last 24, 36 months. Um, we have seen differences in the different sectors, I think, um, and even within the different countries. I would say industrial has been the one that's probably gotten the most press in the last 12 months. Um, this is off the back of Central Europe really becoming a hub for uh, the likes of Amazon, logistics, warehousing, etc. So it's it's an interesting phenomenon when you look at Czech Republic doesn't actually have its own Amazon store, um, but yet we're going to have I think 25,000 employees from Amazon within the next six to 12 months. They continue to expand throughout the country. So that's the one that I would say has been getting the most attention, um, and it's probably the strongest. But as a whole, all of the sectors have really held up um, fairly well over the next while. I think the story will be what happens next. Um, as some of the sectors maybe slow down and other ones continue to grow. And, and Tim, obviously you're, you're active in some of the sort of CE regions, some of the part of the six that Mark was talking about. Um, and there were quite marked differences between some of those countries in terms of the, the macro picture. Um, what's your sense of that? And, and do you see these, these markets as having a, a different speeds or just that there's a time delay between them? What's your sense of that in terms of the macro picture? 
Yeah, I, th I think the main reason is that where Central European economies really started growing in the 90s with a huge amount of Western capital, that process really only started just before the financial crisis and now obviously over the last three or four years in Central and Eastern Europe, in, in Southeastern Europe. So you've seen Romania um, has been the, the fastest growing economy cumulatively over the last three or four years and Bulgaria and Serbia that have got their um, political ducks in a row are now able to get on the same plane, the same growth plane as Romania is currently on. Whether they can sustain that growth in the same way that Poland has over the last 12, 14 years since the, um, Soviet, uh, since the Soviet recession remains to be seen. But certainly at the moment they're being managed very well and they take a lot of advice from supranationals like the ECB, the EIB, EBRD, etc. So uh, we shouldn't underestimate the influence of outside forces here. Um, Mark um, identified the growth in, in roads, for instance, in southeastern Europe. All of that money has been funded by the EU. And so it really is very important for the uh, politicians in these countries to recognise that their success is completely dependent on the money that they get from the supranationals. And so provided they continue to uh, deal with corruption, to manage their um, currencies correctly, then they will continue to get the investment from the supranationals. And that will, as Mark rightly said, will be a driver for growth. I mean, that's interesting, Robert. In, in terms of the, the, the macro picture, um, low interest rates, what are you seeing in terms of the financing market? Um, how is that operating at the moment? Um, and from your position, because obviously you're in CE, um, but for a German bank, in essence, is there an advantage for you in that? And also, um, how does that work with, with some of the risk factors, um, how they may be perceived from, let's say, outside investors looking into the region? Yeah, so for sure, there is, there is a huge you know, difference between you know, CE financing markets and Western European, uh, where the Western European lenders uh, have a much bigger influence on the market, like it is, I don't know, here in Western Europe. In Western Europe, it's the, the financing markets are dominated by the domestic lenders. Uh, in Poland, uh, Czech Republic, where we're active, if it comes to the long-term financing, to the investment uh, financings, this is dominated by, by, by cross-border lenders, so dominated by German banks, uh, Austrian banks, and a yeah, few, few other in the Western European banks. Uh, if it comes to the development business, uh, the, the local banks are dominating that sector here. So, so we, as cross-border lenders, we, we keep away from, from, from you know, developments. Um, the second part of your question. Um, it, was really, it was really about, I mean, Mark mentioned in his um, presentation a little bit about some of the political risk, and obviously risk has been a big topic um, recently. Russia seems to have died away as, as, as a risk. I'm just wondering how, how, when it's going through your credit committees, you see risk in Czech versus Poland, and whether the politics has anything to do with that, really. Of course it always has. I mean, we, 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 we have certain discussions uh, from time to time. Fortunately, um, these discussions um, are not forcing me to slow down. Uh, but of course, having these discussions internally is already a, a certain, would say, disadvantage and also risk, potential risk for, for our, our clients in the future, of course. Okay, good. Um, one of the things I... I I just wanted to pick up with you, Tim, actually, because it's a, it's, a, it's a question that's, that's come in, um, is in terms of the, let's say, let's say particularly Croatia and Serbia, um, are there any particular highlights from those markets in comparison to the ones that, that, uh, that Mark's talked about? Are there any kind of highlights that you see particularly for that, either in terms of sectors or in terms of how you're seeing those regions? Well, I think really um, it, it, the story there is really retail as it is across most of the region really um, and 
in Serbia, you've seen a lot of investment from the Middle East. There's a huge development in, in Belgrade called the Waterfront Development. This, this involves hundreds of millions of, of euros and will certainly change uh, much of, of Belgrade. Um, in Croatia, we've seen the growth of a lot of uh, retail parks and um, of neighborhood centers, not so much large shopping centers as you've seen in uh, Romania and Bulgaria, for instance. But it really is this, this um, investment in future consumer spending. And I think that's the story really across the region. You see it in Central Europe, um, and now it's being picked up in Southeastern Europe. Okay, good. Um, and let, let's just pick up some of those sort of sectors that Tim just talked about there. Um, what's, what's your sense, um, Luke, in, in terms of the sectors? that you're seeing, we, let's, let's start more generally. You've mentioned industrial and logistics. Let's talk more generally a little bit, um, and, and then we can drill down into the specific countries if we want, but uh, let's, let's look in, in general at the, at the sectors and how you're seeing them performing. Um, I would say the story for probably the last 18 months has been much more on the retail side. Um, this has been driven, and this is across the region, really by South African money. I mean, there's been other investors as well, but I would say the, the vast majority of the shopping center deals that we've seen going from Serbia all the way to Poland um, have involved South African money. Uh, we've seen in Southeast Europe, um, the Bulgarian number is, I would say, 80% South African money at this point. Um, so that's been a dominant story um, across the region. And I think retail is something, if, if you're looking towards the future, well, I still think it's gonna be active. I think in a lot of the markets, um, most of the stock has traded hands already. Particularly if you look at Bulgaria at this stage, I would say I think it's six out of their eight main shopping centers have changed hands in the last two months. Uh, sorry, two years. So for us, um, retail is a very interesting one. It's just a question mark around the future uh, in some of these smaller countries. When you look towards Poland, there's still a lot of stock available. Uh, you're seeing secondary cities in Poland continue to be of high interest uh, on the retail front. Um, and a lot of activity. Um, we have a few mandates that we're working on ourselves where we're, we're seeing multiple offers on sites that if it was 24 months ago, we would have been happy with two or three bids coming in. Um, so the retail sector has been the largest component. Um, offices continue to trade throughout the region. The largest issue we see on offices across the markets is, is really a function of supply. Um, due to the volume that we've seen, a lot of the higher quality assets have traded hands. Um, we're seeing the ticket sizes probably reduce a little bit. Um, there's an appetite, there's a huge appetite, if you're looking into Czech Republic in particular, you're looking into Poland, uh, for quality office stock. And it's just a function of this now coming to market. Uh, we see if you move further south, uh, towards the likes of, say, Bulgaria, Romania, where you haven't seen offices trade hands, we think that will be the future, um, in terms of the story for the next, really, two years. Uh, will be around offices starting to trade in those markets, which really hasn't happened. Um, early next year, I think we'll see uh, a mandate that we have uh, in Romania. It'll be circa probably a half billion euros coming to market for office properties in Romania, um, which is really kind of, I would say, a bellwether for the market. It's something that, that really hasn't come to market um, in this cycle at all. And I think that will be the, the future that you'll start seeing is, is bigger tickets coming through Bulgaria, Romania, et cetera. Okay, good. Um, and just, we're all being very polite at the moment. And just as a reminder that I am asking one person, but anybody else can contribute, and that includes you as well. Um, one thing, Robert, from you, um, in terms of the, the types of buildings that we're now seeing, I mean, we mentioned the office a little, office sector there a little bit. Um, what's happening? I mean, certainly in, in conversations that we've been having recently about the offices, uh, the office sector, um, what new offices are going to look like, um, sustainability, but also use of space. Um, what's your sense of, of that in the in the areas that you're working in? You're obviously based out of Warsaw. Collier's office in Warsaw is quite interesting because that's had a, a refit for this sort of new kind of working space. What's your sense of uh, sense of that, and particularly how how the occupier market, I suppose, is is developing from your side? I think what, what we observe, you know, just the last two up to three years, that the <clears throat> that the, the standard uh, asset classes are changing. That we we, we do not have that much more a, a pretty uh, identified standard. So if you are talking about modern and, and newest uh, office properties, 
they very often mixed with some, you know, retail elements, with some restaurants elements, with some leisure elements. So it's not only a pure office building. Uh, the green issue is, is, is also a, 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 a very good one. So for us, for example, for Berlin Hip, uh, the, the entire green uh, kind of thinking and, and sustainability thinking, you know, enables us also to issue so-called green mortgage bonds uh, which which we sell, you know, really like like rolls uh, every day, so they are always oversubscribed. So 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 green sustainable is a topic. And as I said, if we if we look to retail properties, for example, they also changing more and more into I would say yeah, uh, foods, uh, restaurants, and, and and leisure schemes. Yeah? So so the modern shopping centers. They have up to 20% of the entire space is dedicated to, to, to restaurants, to bars, um, uh, to food courts. So, so this is definitely changing. Of course, logistics stays still logistics. Just, just to touch on Robert's point about green and, and the sustainability, I mean, this has been a story in Central Europe that has been pretty active for the last five, six years. And I think what we're actually seeing is now a push towards uh, more a concern around the the tenants and the staff health as well. Um, so it's, it's a slight pivot from sustainability towards um, are the occupiers and are the employees happy with the quality of the space in terms of the design, the functionality, even going down to what air filters are being used, are there bike racks? Um, and these, this is, I think, going to be the next trend that we're going to see. Um, it falls in line with the, the entire concept of um, shared working spaces. You look at WeWork, et cetera, and that's going to be a large trend. It's already been talked about, but it hasn't really exploded into Central Europe yet. But the whole conversation around um, employee health and, and the, I guess, the quality of the working environment is something that we're seeing become more and more important. Maybe as, a, as I can add to, to, to that, uh, if, if we have a look to the BPO uh, sector, uh, as, a, as Mark already mentioned, you know, the, the, the salaries are slightly growing. So there is no much space for, for the providers. So several clients of ours you know, told me that they simply try to attract the, the, the young people uh, with, with very comfortable uh, and very you know, modern, let's say, working places. Yeah? So, so that this is changing really dramatically. And, and, and uh, I don't know, a few years ago, if you went into such typical BPO schemes, they've been you know, boxes and plenty of people you know, sitting uh, very efficient uh, in their rooms today. This looks like you know nice bars and pubs, you know, with I don't know playstations, uh, billiard tables, etc. So, so this is changing also in this sector. And, and Luke, does that then indicate kind of a positive sign, a for the sustainability, I guess, in terms of the investment of those kind of BPO back office servicing ones, because suddenly you're attracting a higher, I guess, higher quality employees. Uh, but, but you're also presumably investing then more into the building that you've got, so therefore it's not necessarily a, a hunt to the bottom in terms of wages. Definitely. I mean, the, the, the cost of um, space in terms of the lease cost for a lot of these BPOs is becoming less and less important. It is driven by, by the cost of labor. Um, so they are willing to even do things, if you look just anecdotally in Bulgaria, um, one of our clients is taking an additional office on the Black Sea simply to have a place where the employees can go and work from in the summer. And then they're also going to look for a skiing office. So in the winter, the employees can go skiing. Um, which is just absolutely incredible, but they said, well, if we can keep people happy and not walking across the street for another four or five euros an hour because we let them work from the Black Sea, that's brilliant. And we're seeing this in a lot of the markets where um, the, the component of the lease cost in the P&L is something where people are willing to spend a little bit more in order to make sure they're not spending more on the labor. Okay, interesting. Does that mean then, Tim, from your point of view, that some of the business that may have been picked up in terms of that back office function is then moving towards the more sort of SEE where the labor costs were cheaper in terms of, of Mark's slides. Are you seeing that? <coughs> yes, there's no doubt that the drive in office growth in Romania and Bulgaria <coughs> is really driven by this sector. So even just last month, for instance, Oracle placed their European um, hardware back office in Romania, having sacked several hundred people across um, other countries in Europe. Uh, 
um, AIG has one of its largest global back offices in Bulgaria, where it employs over 500 people. So you've seen these large, large movements of really international blue chip companies into these regions. Um, one of the things that it has to be stressed is that the, one of the great virtues of communism was its high level of educational um, uh, standards that it set. And those have continued really over the last 25 years or so. And so the employees, the young employees in Romania and Bulgaria, really highly qualified, quite sophisticated thinkers, particularly in te um, technological areas. Um, they all speak English and very flexibly minded. So they're ideal employees for these large international companies. Um, and as, as Mark pointed out earlier, a large number of these people left to come to the UK where we have something like 400,000 Rouma 400, Romanian and Bulgarians and a lot of Romanians moved to Spain as well. When these people will inevitably come back, as a lot of the Polish people move back into Poland, then this will provide a great stimulus um, to the economies of Southeastern Europe, and particularly in this employment sector. Okay, good. Um, and uh, Tim, there's a quick question about um, wh which out of the markets that you're investing in, you're investing most in and why? Um, so let's tackle that. Well, we, we focus on Southeastern Europe. This is 50 to 60 million people. The largest market is Romania, and so that's where we, we really focus. Um, and in order not to compete with the wave of very cheap um, long-term capital from South Af Africa, we're focusing on really Class B assets with high yields, so retail parks, Class B offices, etc. So Romania, really. Okay, good. I'm, I'm going to have whilst we're on whilst we're on this topic, let's let's just have a, a quick look if this works. It does. Okay. So uh, you can, if you if you wildly disagree with that, then you can vote and you can change it. <laughs> um, but uh, looking at this, it looks as though logistics and industrial seem to be the ones that everybody think is going to outperform. Office and residential, interestingly, around the same. Retail slightly lower, and nobody really believing in some of the alternatives, um, whether that's hotels. Um, so let's maybe pick a couple of those things up. Um, what's what's your sense? Are you investing in hotels, um, Tim? Are, are you looking at that sector? No, but okay. uh, actually, rather interestingly, I think that these numbers are slightly wrong because the hotel figures for the region have have shown enormous growth. And there has been a number of very large um, transactions taking place. And at the same time, there's been a huge level of investment in this sector across the region. So while I appreciate um, the audience may not see the growth, they may not like it very much, but in fact, it has been happening. And um, there's a large transaction going through at the moment in uh, Romania with Revitas, specialist fund in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, making an acquisition of over 200 million in the hotel sector, just in Bucharest, as an example. Okay, good. Um, one question in, in for you, Robert, particularly, which is just in terms of the competitiveness of um, longer-term financing. Um, I guess in terms of your particular business, how competitive is that? Do you have an advantage over local banks? Are there any particular um, things in terms of alternative types of financing? W what's the position at the moment? I don't know if I should tell you too much about our advantages because maybe then they disappear uh, quickly. Uh, but, but of course, you know, if, if it comes uh, to us uh, long-term financing, we are competing only with, with, with the foreign lenders, so especially with other German uh, mortgage, uh, mortgage banks. Um, there, are, there are certain reasons for that. There, there, there is a, a bank levy these days. Uh, which applies to, to local banks, to Polish banks, does not apply to us. So it brings us immediately into a, a monetary advantage, which is, you know, on the long run, uh, where, where every basis point counts, uh, very helpful. Um, so honestly speaking, uh, these days we, we, are, we are pretty fine with the market. So there is, there is not that much uh, competition, which is maybe not that good for you guys here, uh, as you are our potential clients. So, so the margins, 
these days are, are much higher than it used to be, for example, in 2007, 2008. Okay, good. Um, I've just put a different poll question up as well, which is about capital and where the capital sources are. Um, so we'll just, let, let's dig in a little bit into that. Um, Mark, what's your sense? You mentioned there in your slides that the kind of capital, and, and you felt that domestic capital was going to be more important. I'll pick this up in a minute. Um, but what are the deals at the moment telling you in terms of that capital? Largely, there's been US and, I guess, Israeli money and South African money. Um, what's your sense of that mix, and particularly for the, for the different countries? Yeah, at present, the, there's a number of deals in the pipeline in the fourth quarter, as I mentioned. We think that the 2016 total of 12.2 billion will be close, be close to it, or maybe it will exceed it, which means around four to five billion likely in the fourth quarter. And there's there's uh, there's one deal we know about, which is the giant uh, logical uh, sale, um, sale of the logical assets across Europe, of which around 750 to 800 million is in Central and Eastern Europe, and that's been purchased by obviously CIC of China. Um, and that's representative, really, of how the Asians are, are approaching things. And there's other deals in other sectors, as I um, mentioned in the hotel sector, uh, that there's, 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 there's purchases, there's been Thai, pur Thai, Thai purchases of hotel assets in Poland and Czech Republic this year from Thailand. Um, and, and there's even uh, interest from Malaysian, South Korean money that's not actually entered yet, but there, there's certainly people looking from, who, who hail from those countries. So, with Asia, it's it's not just China. It's it's many it's many countries, many economies. They're all high G, much higher GDP per capita than, than 20 years ago. So certainly, man, certainly that Asian phenomenon is is quite strong. We're seeing also the beginnings of interest from Turkey, which I see as similar to South Africa, in that Turkey is also an emerging market with a high risk-free rate, a high cost, a high inflation rate, um, high interest rate domestically. So money is being forced out of Turkey, if you like, as it's been forced out of South Africa. Um, but broadly similar reasons. I mean, everyone has a view on Turkish politics, but obviously some, some Turks want to get their money out of the country. Some of it is likely, in my opinion, to come towards CE. We're starting to see that. We've seen deals in Poland, in the office sector, and in Romania uh, as well from Turkey. So that's a new source. Uh, so that's also appeared. But what's interesting in 2017 also is the return of what I call the traditional source. So Europe has bounced back compared to its percentage in 2016 and in absolute terms has grown. Um, and what's interesting there is we're getting more deals out of places like Belgium, uh, Denmark, Sweden, uh, money, which is Swedish money into Poland, uh, Danish money into Poland and Romania, um, Netherlands has, has been an ever present and there's, there's more assets being bought in the Czech Republic from the Netherlands, for example. Um, but it's also Germany, the particular interest from Germany into the regions of Poland. Um, we mustn't forget Poland is a lot more than Warsaw. Three quarters, 75% of the volumes in the last 18 months in Poland have been outside of Warsaw, so not in Warsaw. Uh, so we've seen a lot of German fund interest in assets outside of, of, of Warsaw. And we're talking in Poland, we've got very, some very large cities. We've got 40 cities in Poland with above 100,000 population. So it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a significant uh, population distribution there that's urban and not in Warsaw. So <coughs> German funds have been looking there as well. So quite, a, quite an interesting, uh, different, lots of different countries there. Okay, and, and Luke, what's, what's, what's your sense of, of what's happening? I mean, in, in a discussion that we had uh, in Warsaw, there was the beginnings of um, domestic capital beginning to come in. What do you think of that mix between the US capital, the CE, you know, the CE capital, the, the South African capital? Is that, is that a growing trend for domestic capital investing within the region? Well, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, as Mark's slide illustrated, the largest investor into Central Europe was ourselves, uh, which is a pretty unique factor for us and something new. Um, and off the back of that, one thing I think that's really important to note is that the majority of that is simply just from the Czech Republic. So if you look at the other countries in the region and you realize Polish investment, I think it was only about 4% um, domestic investment within Poland. Um, 
and there's been talks, obviously, in Poland about REIT legislation going through. Unfortunately, just a few weeks ago, um, that was kind of changed. Originally, the idea was January 1st, there'd be REIT legislation that you would start seeing <coughs> commercial REITs in Poland step in and start playing the same role that you've seen domestic funds in Hungary and Czech Republic and Slovakia play. Um, but the government has changed it to be, I think I've lost my mic, there it's back. It's back. Um, the government has changed it to be residential only, which frankly was, was a bit disappointing for us in the commercial sector because REITs on a residential basis, we're not even sure how it would work in Poland because there's not really a, a, a build to rent market. Uh, maybe that will happen. Um, but we're still also hoping that the, the government changes its mind and, and does adopt some form of commercial REIT legislation because for us as a, as a region, that's going to be what drives the next cycle of growth. Whenever there is going to be um, a correction in the market, it's going to be this domestic capital that really backstops um, the transactions and is still going to be present in the market. So that will be the next big trend is whether some of the countries like Romania and Poland are able to increase the percentage of domestic capital uh, being invested into the market. I mean, that's interesting. You mentioned residential there as well. Um, what's your sense of that? I mean, residential pricing increasing dramatically in the Czech Republic. Um, does that mean that you're going to get um, a PRS sector, do you think, in the region? Um, and that question to Tim as well, I guess. Um, the, the answer is yes. Uh, the, the starting position here is that in southeastern Europe, 90% of the um, residential is um, owner-occupied. And this is not surprising because the collapse of communism, all of the uh, people just got given their apartments and then since then there's been very little development so you've seen a very static residential market but in fact one of the things that we're very interested in is the um, rental sector particularly in, in uh, cities like Bucharest and Sofia simply because you've got this young dynamic uh, labour force and you've got this um, very old fashioned um, uh, Soviet blocks and one of the ways that you will drive the extension of the expansion of residential um, could be the development of rental. Um, and we believe that although it's very early stages, it will be a driver for growth, certainly. Okay, good. Um, ju just while we're on the, did you want to pick that up in terms of PRS, Luke, for, for the rest of the region as well, you know, so Poland, Czech Republic especially? Yeah, I, I think, um the hardest part of the Czech Republic in terms of residential development is actually getting a development done. Um, there's a lot of local developers that are building as fast as they can, but it's, it's much more around the bureaucracy and also the availability of plots. Um, so that's also what you've seen the, the home prices in Czech Republic rise 13, up to 13%. That's part of what's driving it is simply a lack of new supply. Um, I think that there's, there's room for kind of build to rent opportunities, um, and we're actually seeing a few developers we've met with that are looking to do that. They're actually converting their original plans um, from the traditional model of, of build to sell, and they're looking to actually start to rent them out um, because they want to hold and they want the cash flow that it generates. So I think you're going to start seeing that, but until the government probably unlocks a little bit more opportunity on the development side, you need a certain amount of scale to start adopting this new platform and, and build kind of a larger scale kind of four or five hundred unit residential scheme. Okay, good. I'm going to come to you in a second on that in, in terms of this, but let, let's let's just have a look and see what what you all thought in terms of the, the capital changes. Um, so view about Asian capital, and maybe we should pick that up actually, because that's quite an interesting point. Uh, domestic capital, yes. Difficult to say, 10%. I, I'd go difficult to say at the moment, but we'll, <laughs> we'll see. Um, so let's let's just let's just pick that up. Are you seeing, Robert, in terms of the sources of capital? A, do you see more of this domestic capital, and maybe what's your sense of whether re regimes will actually encourage some of that? Um, and what are you seeing in terms of Asian capital beginning to be interested? Are you are you seeing that in terms of who's coming to you for financing opportunities? I mean, if it comes to the domestic capital, uh, I, I don't see it in, the, in a classy way yeah, that, that, that we see it in now huge uh, Polish uh, or other investors uh, buying commercial real estate. Uh, if, if, if we will go a little bit deeper and, and, and if there is a taxi driver who is buying these days uh, three or four uh, flats and renting them in Warsaw, 
uh, this is of course domestic capital invested in real estate. So, so what we see that, that the people are uh, you know, withdrawing their funds uh, out of the current accounts and then buying real estate on their own. Yeah? But these are private individuals. Uh, on the entire REIT discussion, uh, this, this became in the meantime, you know, a political issue. Yeah? So, so our current politicians do not believe that. Uh, that that those people who establish these reads uh, will, let's say, will will do it properly and and, and will treat the future investors uh, honestly. So so therefore, there is this slight move to as, to allow reads only for residential. A uh, reason for that is a little bit historical one. We already had you know some domestic public funds. Uh, 2004, 2005, and they unfortunately messed it up a little bit. Yeah. So, so they did not invest properly. They did not choose the best projects, uh, and, and this did not work out. So, our current government is a little bit concerned about about that. Okay, um, let me let me just pick up a, a couple of things um, on the liquidity in the market. Um, Tim, how do you see that? Do you if we've got more domestic investors coming in, do you think these markets, particularly the ones that you're looking at, are increasingly becoming more liquid? Because one of the arguments before, obviously, was, yes, there may be good returns, but what am I going to do when I need to sell at the end of that process? Yes, I, I think in Southeastern Europe, you, you won't really see local I investors. You, you may see some money moving from, so uh, you may see some coming from Central Europe into Southeastern Europe, so PPF has made a couple of investments in the region. But essentially, you'll continue to see the, the, the main drivers that the audience have seen, which is South Africa, the Europeans, and really not many Americans, frankly. Um, and I think that that will be the story. What I think you'll see perhaps slightly more continental European investors coming, in, particularly those institutions that didn't go in last time because there are a number of large investors like AEW, Deggy, for instance, which, which made some poor investments and are, are only just getting out now, nine or ten years after those investments were made, with quite heavy losses. So they won't be coming back in. But you will see, I think, um, investors from, as we, we've heard from perhaps Denmark or Nordic investors, some of the smaller Germans coming in to add liquidity into Southeastern Europe. The only thing that I'd add to that is I think on the on the logistics industrial sector, um, I would suspect that Southeast Europe is going to be continued to, to kind of consolidate by the likes of P3, CTP, etc. Um, you've seen them expand incredibly rapidly, particularly in Romania um, over the last 12 to 18 months, and, and I don't see any sign of that slowing down. I think the, the industrial logistics sector is going to be dominated by our more kind of central European players. And um, one thing that, that obviously the argument a lot of the time is that if you're seeing an increase in logistics, and especially if that's driven by e-commerce, um, that's potentially got a negative impact on the retail side. Um, anybody can take this really. What's your sense of, there's a lot of interest in the room, certainly about the retail side, how you see that in the region. Um, do we buy into Mark's story of more money in your pocket, and so therefore retail is going to outperform? Um, or do you see there being more competition with e-commerce? What, what's your sense of that? Uh, it, it's, it's obviously been a huge story for us, and, and it's still a question mark around how the idea of e-commerce is going to impact the retail um, world in our markets. Um, the general consensus, though, or at least on our side, is, is that uh, for the foreseeable future, if you've got a dominant shopping center, either city center or capital, that's fantastic. You can hold on to that and it's going to be safe. In the secondary cities, again, if you've got more of a dominant regional center, particularly one that has some kind of entertainment um, capacity to it where you've got, I don't know, where you've got playgrounds for children and it becomes more than a shopping center, it becomes almost an entertainment hub for those markets. Those are still quality investments that we're seeing a lot of interest in. Where we're seeing a massive slowdown is anything other than that. When you get to kind of the secondary or third tier shopping centers uh, in secondary cities, 
Those are very difficult right now because you're having troubles on the leasing, you're going to have troubles on liquidity, and there's just a question mark around what will e-commerce do to those sites. Um, the the e-commerce penetration in our markets is still very low when you compare it to the EU average. When you look at Poland, I think it was something like 15% of people have made purchases online in the last year, whereas in the UK it's something closer to I think 80%. Um, so that will shift, but I think you've got a long lead time on that. Um, and particularly, our markets have a history of using shopping centers as kind of destinations for the community. So that will continue, provided that you've got good assets. And Tim, what's the sense of it where you are? Is it, is it sort of dominant shopping centers people should be looking for, or convenience? What's, what's, the, what's the winner there? No, I, th I think it is dominant uh, shopping centers for sure, because as Luke said, really they're destinations, they're leisure destinations. Um, and, and you'll see the continued growth of retail parks, etc., into the smaller towns and cities because these are very efficient retail conduits. If you can go and buy your, your power drill from a local DIY store, um, why would you necessarily get it on Amazon? Um, one of the important points to make here is that uh, movement around Romania and Bulgaria and even Poland is still pretty poor. So actually, moving goods um, is, is not necessarily easy, and the postal services in these countries, well, certainly Southeastern Europe, are not desperately effective. So while we're used to next day delivery um, on Amazon, I'd be very surprised if they could achieve that across most of Romania, quite frankly. So I'm slightly skeptical about e-commerce. E um, we've seen it grow in very sophisticated markets. I suspect that certainly the further east you go, the, the longer it will be before it takes hold. Um, uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I can add one thing uh, to this topic in uh, e-commerce. Uh, what, what we see if, if we are financing these days in you know, the dominant shopping centers, you know, independently, this is what we're talking about Warsaw, we're talking about the regions, uh, we see significant changes. So if, if we have a look to the, uh, to the turnovers, uh, you know, such, you know, <clears throat> Tenants like I don't know, Media Mart, Saturn, yes, so, so to the electronics. Those guys are not doing that, not, not performing that well anymore in terms of turnovers per square meter. But nevertheless, they need the stores uh, because they, they, the stores, you know, act like, like, you know, flagship stores, something like that. So people come in, they touch the newest technologies, they touch the stuff, and very often they, they go into the internet and and all that there, sometimes even they, they picking up. So there are, there are huge, you know, pick up centers uh, within the shopping centers. The same with fashion, you know, we see in this dominant shopping centers, we see more and more flagship stores. So there is not much of, uh, you, you can't find much of clothes there, but there is, I don't know, uh, one huge uh, picture of uh, Lionel Messi with the newest Adidas. Uh, Issues and then and, and the, the kids are running around that and, and, and buying through the internet. Yeah, um, yeah, just just to add to that last point, that one debate and I think is also here in the UK is how you how shopping centres and, and landlords deal with turnover rents. So in, exactly in that situation that someone's using using the shop as a as a as a almost an ad, as an advertising and marketing tool and the purchase is actually done online, well how does the shopping centre get any revenue from that? Well it doesn't. So this, this is a bit of an issue for the retail sector to solve. And it's not, I don't believe that the, 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 the solution has been arrived at, um, but it's certainly something that it needs to be addressed. But yes, I mean certainly as a user of shopping centres in the region myself, you can see that the, the transformation towards this idea of window shopping, this idea of entertainment, the, certainly the increased provision of entertainment and leisure has been massive in the region in the last couple of years. And certainly the, the outfill in the Czech Republic and Poland has been quite substantial in terms of the shopping centre expansion in this way. I mean, we've already seen some of the owners start talking, or shopping centre owners talking about in the future whether they would p charge rents based on footfall rather than revenue with the idea being that it's actually how many people are they driving to their stores rather than the actual purchases that they make. And this is addressing exactly the point that was made before around the fact that a lot of the time it's a showroom rather than an actual sales floor now. Um, so we don't know where that's going to go, but it's a conversation that's starting to take place in, in our markets, particularly I would say Poland, 
um, there's questions around how we're going to restructure the leases. Okay, good. I've got a particular question from George as well for you, Tim, which is in terms of Romania and the industrial and logistics side especially, um, how do you see that developing? Is that a good opportunity? Um, it is, as Luke says, it's really dominated by um, two players uh, and a handful of smaller players below them, and that will certainly be the case uh, moving forward. Um, and, and it is dependent totally on the development of both um, the retail sector and also of the automotive sector. Um, but because, again, you have a problem with a lack of uh, motorway network, is it, it's not possible for any of the logistics operators to build a genuine national network. So this is quite a, a challenge, I think, to build an efficient um, supply chain uh, for but by logistics groups. And so I think although you, you'll see individual investment continued by P3 and, and CTP, I think it'll still be on, a, on an almost discrete basis supplying that local region rather than um, creating a national network. And is, is part of it, Luke, as well, um, in terms of the industrial logistics side, um, the kind of new Silk Road idea of um, transportation coming directly from China across Europe through uh, CE, essentially, through, through some of those markets? Is that going to be a driver? Absolutely. Um, we've been discussing projects specifically around that in the last few weeks where we've seen um, whether it's kind of more industrial logistics operators and also people that have land parcels um, looking to how do they take, say, even goods from Russia and get them into Central Europe. So you're looking at things like uh, the, the, the gauges on the tracks in terms of the trains and how are we going to adjust for that and which routes are going to become the dominant ones as they come from basically the east into the west. Um, so that is going to be the next phase is kind of the Silk Road. Exactly where the Silk Road goes though is actually the real question of which countries is it going to bisect and which routes is it going to go through. Um, I think is going to be a question that a lot of people are looking to solve right now. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And this is really tied up with the politics because one route from the Moscow Road actually goes through Ukraine into Poland. As Luke says, there's a change of a railway gauge there on the Car Carpathians. The alternative route is, of course, across the Black Sea, and this would be a huge boost for the Romanians and the port of Constanza. Constanza is the largest port in the Black Sea. It's also a very important a geopolitical position now because the US government views Romania as the edge of Europe. It doesn't view Turkey as the edge of Europe anymore. Constanza is also a naval port. So you can see a huge amount of investment going into that sector. And if the Romanians can ever build a motorway that goes from Constanza all the way into Hungary and connect to the European motorway system, then that will be the defining route. And so that kind of infrastructure investment could make a significant change to that market. Um, and that's quite interesting in terms of the idea about Asian investors, because one of the big things that came through very clearly from our trip to China was that they were looking heavily at where is their infrastructure and where is there a government that, whether they like it or not, just does what it says it's going to do and can actually make it move through. But infrastructure was one of the main things that they were looking to invest around. Um, so that may also indicate some of that, which is good. Um, I, I wanted to just pick up a couple of things um, on, I'm going to put them broadly under the category of risk, but one of them was a question that quite a number of people wanted, which is, in terms of the yields, if, if prime yields are getting down to 4 or 5%, um, given the risk, not necessarily the political risk, but you also mentioned that, uh, but given the risk of potentially overdevelopment, those kinds of things, why should people look at that rather than secondary Western European opportunities? Um, what's your sense about how investors are seeing that? Um, and, and how do you see those risks? That could be for anybody. Yes, so we've been, we've been asked you know, several times by, by, by several clients, you know, especially if it comes to the political risk these days. And uh, concerning Poland, there is currently no yield compression. And so we see that, that due to the political situation, uh, which I'm not a friend of, but uh, nevertheless I would say that this is the, the, the most positive impact of the current you know, bad policy our, our government is, is doing. 
uh, that that the prices are still reasonable. Yeah? So um, uh, we 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 see that there is not such a huge investor's interest, but but every um, um, property which which comes to the market is also finally being sold. Uh, so therefore, this this is from my perspective an opportunity for investors who, of course, uh, do not jump you know quickly into the country, buy something, and and then move away again. But investors who say, okay, I, I have a long term perspective. Uh, those who um, also let's say engage local people, run their local offices. Uh, for these investors, I would say this is this is still a very good opportunity in Poland to, to, to invest these days. And, uh, and just, just for you, Luke, in terms of Czech Republic, I mean, Mark there mentioned recent election. Are we going to have Czechsit to go with Brexit, or is that...? <laughs> no. Um, I think that the elections that we had recently, um, although in the media it's been kind of reported on a mixed basis, uh, our view is, is that it will be business as usual. Um, it's uh, still got a strong leading party um, that is, I would say, on the whole, rather uh, pro-business or neutral. Um, I think that any coalition that they make uh, will still make sure that we don't throw a spanner in the works and, and derail the economy. So um, while there was, I would say, an element of kind of anti-EU um, in terms of the voting, uh, it was 10% in, in the sense of the party that is anti-EU. About 10% of the votes probably won't be part of the coalition, and even if they are, they won't have enough influence to really derail the policy of the Czech Republic. So I think out, after any election, there's always angles that are thrown out by the media uh, because they want to make a story out of it. Um, but as a whole, we're comfortable with it. We think that it's probably a, a positive for the market. We're going to have stability. Um, and in, in, in fact, the vote could have been much more fractured than it could have been otherwise. So I think as a whole, it's, it's a positive note. OK, good. And Tim, obviously, uh, very recently, Hungary, something that people didn't want to look at at all. Now that's completely changed around. Um, how are the risks in comparison, do you think? So I, I think people have got used to Mr. Orban now. They're sort of just going to accept that he's there. He's not, not been quite as bad as everybody thought. And so you've seen the benefits um, accruing in the real estate market there. In, in the Balkan countries, politics um, is very messy, very difficult to follow and very arcane and frankly um, it's it's um, it, it is difficult it's, it's not an it, there is political risk in, in every single country in southeastern Europe and it just has to be followed very carefully but I think it's very important to take the big view which is that all of the countries are either in the EU or like Serbia coming in coming in and so they're all greatly influenced as I mentioned before by the supranationals and it does look as if the politicians, generally speaking, are now following the, the guidance um, which, which actually will, call, will, will result in the best performance of their, their countries and their, or their, and their economies, and then will keep them um, in power as, as elected representatives. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, just to add on Hungary briefly, talking to Hungarian investors directly about this issue, that they, they characterize Mr. Orban as saying, well, we've had Mr. Orban for quite some time now, since 2010, we're used to, as, as you said, we're used to, we're used to him, and by the way, the rest of the, the situation, the rest of the world's got worse. <laughs> so, if you've got Mr. Trump in America now, we've got Mr. Orban, he's not so bad. <laughs> so, it's kind of the, the way the Hungarians almost sarcastically see the situation. Um, but to answer the question, uh, the difference between secondary Western Europe and East and CEE, which are trading at similar yields, is 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 what I've hopefully got across in the slides. This idea of growth. That Hungary is the slowest growing economy at 3.2 percent. They're all growing faster than that, and uh, therefore there is a there is a support for for rents that I would argue is a lot stronger in CEE and has greater potential on a multi-year basis to keep growing. The, the process of what we call convergence, i.e. these countries' GDP per capita per head growing towards the EU average is, is very clear. And as they grow towards the EU average, it's the, those, those rents that the, tenant, that the tenants are generating 
that, that then drive capital values over, over, the, over the very long term. So I, that's what I see the difference between the two. The, the other component that we've heard from a few investors is that um, the age of the stock and the quality of the stock, there's actually a fairly big gap. If you look at most of our office stock and retail stock is at most 10 years old, whereas if you're going to secondary markets in, in Western Europe, um, it's completely different. So I think if you're looking at it from a long-term perspective, there's the argument that A-class buildings in Warsaw are truly A-class, whereas if you're going to secondary markets in, in countries in Western Europe, it, it may not be at the same standard as what you're going to find in Poland or, or Prague right now. Okay, good. Um, I just wanted to very quickly touch on development, um, and then we'll, we'll finish up. There's, there's one poll remaining, which is where do you think the biggest investment volumes will be in 2018? You can answer that, should you wish. Um, I'll do that in a second. Um, but I just wanted to check on um, development. Um, plainly, if you've got unemployment, the economic fundamentals, it suggests that development should be a good opportunity. Um, what's happening, I guess, in terms of financing, Robert? Is that perceived as more risky? Whether you're doing it or not um, is one thing. But how's how is development being financed at the moment? Are there countries where it is, where it isn't? What's the situation on the ground? So, as I already said, we we, we are not let's say market leader in developments. Of course, from time to time, we also do development financings. Uh, but if it comes to Poland, uh, this segment is is uh, dominated by the local banks. And here I must say uh, the conditions uh, are improving you know, on a quarterly basis. So, so there, there is a huge competition between, between the local banks uh, and they simply run this fight uh, over the structures. So pricing is probably always the same, uh, which does not uh, pretty much, um, yeah, uh, is not disturbing the, the development process. So, so the pricing for a developer is not uh, not, not the relevant element. It's much more, you know, pre-lease requirements, and this are going drastically down. Yes. So, so, so local banks, uh, several projects, they're 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 even asking no no pre-lease, which is you know heaven for a developer. Uh, and uh, also, if it comes to the to the to the to, to the speed of that process, this is improving. So. I think you know financing for developers these days in Poland uh, is an easy exercise. Okay, good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Poland is a very strong developers market right now for the reasons that Robert mentioned. But also, when you look at um, just the volume that's come to the market in the last year, you've got Q22, you've got the Spire, HB Reavis is building a massive project that will be the the tallest skyscraper in Central Europe, and. When you look at these factors, I mean, there is an argument in, in Warsaw that we're going to have to see a lot of absorption to make up for this. Um, we believe it's going to be driven by the BPO sector, um, but there is still a question mark because the, the volume of development is so high in Warsaw. Prague is a bit of a different story. Um, it's a much harder market to find land plots. Uh, it's a much harder market to actually, I, I wouldn't say get financing, but to get the project off the ground. Uh, we don't really see any massive office projects coming up online in Prague. Um, and I would say across the region, development's actually probably a little bit slower than it could or should be. Um, there would be an argument also in Hungary that you, we could do with another few office buildings uh, when you look at the current vacancy levels. Um, and I would say developers, the hardest part right now is finding land plots. Particularly in Hungary, you've seen land prices essentially double uh, in the last 18 months um, for any kind of office, even B-class office areas. Uh, the, the land price is just skyrocketing. Okay, good. Um, I want to leave enough time uh, for you to also be able to ask questions in the coffee break afterwards. Um, but let's let's just quickly uh, let's just quickly have a look at, at this one. Let's see. Okay, Poland, Hungary out on its own there, but that was a bit of a harsh question because it's unlikely to get the biggest investment volumes on its own, I fear. Um, but it looks as though we all favour Poland. Um, quite <coughs> interesting. Um, and. Just, just a last question for you guys, really, um, which is, um, let's pick up on the investment thread. So we'll start with you, Mark. Um, in terms of your, you can come at it from a research point of view if you like, um, but if everybody here was wanting to invest, um, where, would your, where would the research be telling them they should be investing and why? Okay, on trillion dollar question. On, uh, or $500 million question. <laughs> 
No, I, I would, on a 12-month view, think that you'll get the best returns from, I'd put 50% into Hungary, and specifically, uh, I'd probably go industrial retail, and I'd put 50% into Romania. Um, and there, the argument on the latter one is, what they argument on both is yield compression. Um, and also, you're obviously getting a steady, steady and decent rental yield for both of them. But uh, yeah, but 50-50. Okay, good, Robert. So if I will do it on a, on a quick uh, round, so quick decision and quick investment, I will go to Poland and into, into dominant uh, shopping centers. Uh, if I will take it a little bit more complex uh, on the longer run, I will definitely have a closer look to residential, residential for rent. But here uh, I would need to, I don't know, hire people, uh, I think, you know, from, from Germany probably, because in Poland we are lacking, you know, a, a knowledge how to manage such properties. Yes, so there is, there is simply no, uh, no knowledge about that because this product was not existing. Uh, we also building not efficient enough in Poland uh, for that type of properties. So here building up a team and, and dedicating and concentrating on that with the goal to come to the market in five years or something like that with, with that sustainable product. Okay, good Luke. Sure, if I was, if I was looking at this more of long-term investment, um, from my view, I would say industrial in Hungary, if you can find it. Uh, I would say Romania um, in terms of offices and logistics. Um, and I would even sprinkle in Bulgaria just for the returns because I think if you're not as concerned about liquidity, uh, there are some very good opportunities there um, and the ticket sizes are fairly reasonable. Um, so you can get into that market and get a nice return that will fill out the portfolio. Well, given that 500 million <coughs> will buy you an awful lot of real estate in Southeastern Europe, I think I'd divide it between logistics, um, spread equally more or less across the countries, um, retail parks, neighborhood centers, and finally into residential uh, for rent. Great, thank you.